via Zoom during the coronavirus crisis of 2020. I'm Dr. Frank Spidell, a retired emergency physician and recovering hospital administrator. Thanks for watching The Doctor Is In, where we explore the challenges of healthcare in the U.S. and the issues we must decide on. But first, a disclaimer. For as Shakespeare reminds us, foolery, sir, does walk about the orb like the sun. It shines everywhere. So I invite you to consider my comments with a most robust and brutal skepticism, for I am neither an epidemiologist, public health official, or infectious disease specialist. The tragedy of COVID-19 pandemic continues and expands. In the U.S., we have lost 124,000 to death and the toll rises daily. Perhaps I can steal from Charles Dickens, for as he said, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Now for some good news. The CDC uh, reports the provisional COVID death uh, count and it continues to drop. You'll see a slide that shows it peaking around the mid to uh, back part of April and uh, dropping. Also, for the Washington Post, who publishes a seven-day death average, we see once again a continued decline in death. But I don't think COVID-19 is behind us, and I doubt it ever will be. So where are we? Well, we are more aware of public health agencies guiding our response to COVID in the U.S. Despite its low profile prior to COVID, public health is quite a substantial part of the U.S. Here's our, you'll see a slide for our spending on public health, and I note that beginning in 1908, 1998, there was a marked expansion in spending in the uh, NIH and CDC. What's the spending by? Let's look at some of the organizational graphs. You're going to see a slide that shows the organizational graph for health and human services. It's quite impressive and extensive, and I want to call your attention to it has several agencies that we hear about the CDC, the NIH, and the FDA, and also an Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Let's go a little bit deeper. Here's the organization chart for the CDC. Also, let's look a little bit deeper in the Health and Human Services tree at an organization called the National Institute of Health. You're going to see a very wonderful uh, artistic slide. It's, it's, it's a circle. Uh, and it shows the agencies, the, inst the institutes that are present in the National Institute of Health. You'll also see a slide that lists categorically the different agencies and a more traditional organization chart for uh, National Institute of Health. Now, diving deep, we have in the NIH a National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Disease. And you'll see the traditional slide for that, as well as a mission statement for the National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Disease. And by now, we most of us readily recognize Dr. Tony Fauci, who has been the head of National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. The recommendations and observation of Dr. Fauci and his colleagues in public health are widely reported and implemented by those we have elected. Now, sometimes these pronouncements don't always inspire confidence. It's the way with human behavior. We don't always have our best game. Among these recommendations, we hear of a need for testing and contact tracing. Now, a word about testing. The viral genome for COVID SARS-2 has been around for a while. It was published by the Chinese on 11 January of this year. On the 17th and 23rd of January, German tests were available for it. South Korea had testing available on February 4th, and the UK had an RT polymerase chain reaction test available on 10 February. Our rollouts of testing didn't go so smooth. After we got some problems cleaned up, the US joined the testing club around February 28th. And really, this was a performance that was not what we wanted. Uh, concerns about rollout need not to be limited to just the testing problems. Uh, some of the unsettling things have been comments made during the pandemic about things like travel, fomite transmission, and COVID is like seasonal flu or is not like seasonal flu. And I won't even mention that worn thin 
face mask comments that keeps popping up every time depending depending on what we see and what we watch. Now, one thing that comes out of this as we go forward, I think we probably need a better understanding of the COVID-19 disease. But also I think we may need to have a healthy inspection of the labyrinth that is public health. Well, no matter how quickly one talks, there is always more material here than one show can manage. Fortunately, we have as our guest today, Professor Michael Levasseur, PhD, MPH, and an epidemiologist and biostatistician from the Dornsife School of Public Health of Drexel University. Uh, the professor will help clarify the role and use of testing and the challenges going forward in this time of COVID. Professor, welcome to the Dr. Is In. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a, a, I think, a, a, a tendency to be surprised when something new comes on like, uh, like COVID. How have you been surprised and uh, what are the lessons we're learning as, as this evolves? Well, I think that there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, I think the thing I'm most surprised at uh, is how unprepared that we've been for this uh, pandemic. Um, I know early on, uh, I've been following uh, this virus since I think the 2nd of January was the first time that I saw a report on it. Um, and I, I sort of had faith that our institutions would would be in place to, you know, take care of all the things that needed to happen, the quarantines, the the shutting down of, of our borders uh, in a timely manner. Um, and and I know that that we have closed our borders, but I, you know, it was clearly too late um, for for what we needed. Uh, there there's been a scramble for information um, and you know some some guidance that that has been different between you know the World Health Organization, for example, and the CDC. Um, and and I think that's what's been most surprising to me is sort of the lack of coordination. And, and I think that we have a lot to learn about how we uh, should respond to future pandemics, because as we know, this isn't the first pandemic that we've experienced, certainly in our lifetimes, and it won't be the last. For the record, Mike, you and I did not rehearse this beforehand, but I wanna thank you because you're, you're sort of uh, supporting uh, this little concept that this myriad we have in public health of agencies uh, we have multiple authorities with overlapping and at times conflicting mission statements. If the information we're getting is confusing at best and contradictory at worst, that almost comes from the structure. When everybody is in charge, nobody's in charge. One of my favorite ancient cliches. Uh, how do you feel? Uh, how do you do? You think people? Uh, people that are knowledgeable and aware and catching news, do you think they, if you ask them, could they write down what our current public health strategy is for COVID-19? I don't know that I could write down our <laughs> COVID-19. You can't, no one can. Well, I think, I think the problem is that we have, you know, 51 different plans for COVID-19. Um, and that's, I think that's built into the design. Of, of public health infrastructure in the United States, which largely is driven by the states who have more power. Um, public health is, is something that's, because every state has their own public health concerns. And I think that's a really good built-in feature. And, and the, a lot of the federal agencies are really there more for oversight yes, um, or for advisory uh, capacity. So on the one hand, uh, that, that most states have the ability to, you know, control their own public health um, interests and, and, and uh, surveil the diseases that are most important to them. I'll, in a lot of ways, when you're talking about a respiratory infection like COVID that doesn't understand the border between New York and Pennsylvania or Pennsylvania and New Jersey, um, you know, those those sor sorts of things fall to the wayside. And so I think that that it was really smart for some of the states to sort of join together to try and come up with a joint plan. And it seems like that that's been a, an effective strategy, and I think something that we're going to see moving forward. But you know, New York is a very different state from Pennsylvania for a variety of reasons, and Ohio is a different state from Florida. So, you know, I, I think that that there's a there's a, a silver lining to the fact that we have more independent agencies within um, our public health infrastructure, and not just a top down uh, a top down uh, structure. Yeah, I can appreciate that. I think Montana is vastly different than New York in, in so many ways. 
hearing about testing. Tell me about testing. What kind of tests are there? So in theory, there are three different types of tests, two of which are currently available and one which they're trying to develop. Um, the one that you're going to hear most common is the diagnostic test or the RT-PCR test. That's the nasal swab. Largely, it's the nasal swab. But they, they can also do um, uh, throat swabs or uh, fecal swabs for COVID-19. That kind of test is going to tell you whether or not there's virus in you right now. It looks specifically for the genetic material from the virus. Then you have the antibody tests, um, which uh, test whether or not you have had an infection at some point with COVID-19. And uh, we are pretty sure that the antibody results um, start to develop after about 10 days of infection. So they, they don't really do much to tell you whether or not you're currently infected, uh, but they can tell you if you've been infected in the past. The third type is the antigen test, which is uh, a little bit easier to, uh, to administer than the PCR test um, and can be used as the point of care test in your doctor's office. And this tests for the presence of a specific antigen that the virus produces, which can tell you whether or not you currently have an infection. So those are the three types. I know that we're, we're trying really hard to develop the antigen test uh, because that, that's gonna be a single point of care test. It doesn't have to go to a lab for the results to come back and it's sort of rapid results. Uh, the information, excuse me, the data we get, how can we use the data from the test that says you have the disease right now or you've had or you have had the disease? How can we use that? Uh, how's that going to help us? Yeah, so the data are a really giant question mark. I have a blog post that I wrote up um, in mid-April talking about the testing because every, every location has had different testing priorities, especially early on in the, in the pandemic in the United States when we didn't have enough test kits available. So Mike, could you elaborate a bit about using this data? In particular, I hear a lot about uh, containment uh, and uh, this tracking of contacts. What's that about? So the data are really dynamic and we have, um, We've seen a lot of issues with the data where certain states are reporting data on certain numbers and not on others. So for example, the hospitalization data, which to me is a really important indicator. Some places are reporting like new admissions to the hospital and other places are reporting the number of hospital beds taken up by COVID patients on a given day. Those are different indicators. So it's hard to compare between say Florida and Georgia, if they're reporting two different metrics, right? Yes. But with, um, internally within the state, it should be fairly consistent. So you can still see the trends over time in each of the locations. Now, when it comes to the tracking and tracing, with the, with the test results, if we can test a large number of people, we can see who's infected in a given moment, we can quarantine them, we can make sure that they're not spreading the virus to other people, and we can trace the contacts that they've had over the course of the past five days to make sure that they're safe and not pass you know, the infection to other people. So that's really what we're talking about with the track and trace. That's where I get confused because we know that, and we don't know the numbers, but I have a sense that probably close to half people or maybe more that are infected are minimally to non-symptomatic, and we don't know who they are. So how could we contain the spread of the virus unless we had the ability to instantaneously, in a given region, test everybody and instantaneously have those results, like the antigen test you were talking about? Then you'd be able to figure out who has it and isolate them and quarantine their contacts after you trace them. But as we speak, this thing has been out there and spreading asymptomatically to other people who will have half of their contacts be asymptomatic. I don't see how this could be a, a reasonable policy going forward. The toothpaste is out of the tube. It is, um, but if we can get the numbers down enough through non-pharmaceutical interventions like wearing face masks, social distancing, staying home when you don't have to be. These are the policies that we've been doing for the past few months. States decided to open up, largely due to political pressure, certainly not by my advice. And now we're seeing uh, cases start to increase. And, you know, contact tracers are people. They have a nine to five job. 
if there are a thousand cases, the number of contact tracers you have may not be able to do their job. Whereas if you have 10 cases, it's a whole lot easier to trace that. So I don't think that we're prepared to open up our communities and our economies until we can really identify who's ill and be able to, to track those who are around. And that's why it's important that we continue to do these social distancing measures that we've been discussing. There's, there is there is only a minimal harm to social distancing and wearing face masks. How long will we do this, though? It's a great question. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, what's the end game for this? That's also a great question. Um, <laughs> That depends on a number of factors. Uh, do we get some kind of uh, miraculous finding from one of the drug trials that we have, where we have a very uh, effective medication that prevents the more severe uh, illness associated with this disease, or something that prevents the infection entirely, a, a pre-exposure prophylactic sort of, sort of uh, drug. Like a vaccine. Or maybe there's a vaccine that's effective. Um, the vaccine is complicated because a lot of people don't, just don't want to get vaccinated because they're afraid of, I don't know, whatever they're afraid of. Um, I think, you know, when the, if a vaccine is announced, I'll be one of the first people in line to go get it because I trust science, but I'll be there ahead of you, but please be six feet behind. Uh, exactly. We'll, we'll meet up in line. Um, but yeah, like those would be really big game changers. Um, if, if a vaccine were announced tomorrow and that they're ready to, to deliver it to everyone, um, in the country, and it's effective, um, we may still not be comfortable reopening if everyone doesn't get it. We'd need about 70% of the population, um, probably at minimum, to be vaccinated to prevent chain transmission of this disease. I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that uh, I suspect, and I'm certainly, I have no real knowledge of this, but I get the sense that you're talking about uh, the need for 60 to 70 percent of the pop 70 percent of the population to have immunity to blunt this spread uh one of the challenges though is while this is a novel while it's a unique virus uh it's not an anomalous virus these things tend to act like they're brothers and sister viruses uh and i i was sharing with before we went on the air that uh dr fauci was uh testifying that uh, the best we could hope for for a vaccine was 70% effectiveness. We've never had a seasonal influenza vaccine that was 70% effective. They're usually about 60%. Sometimes they're as low as 29%. And since this is, this is not an anomalous vaccine, it's an RNA, which means it's going to mutate, and it has multiple species, so you're going to have pandemic level mutations at some point, this thing is going to mutate. And whatever vaccine we have will have variable effectiveness over time. I almost wonder if this is not looking like the folks, the, our brothers and sisters in Sweden, where they've adopted the, the approach to we'll get herd immunity by letting young people who are, for the most part, uh, minimally affected by this disease, get the disease and supplement that with uh, with the best vaccine we can come up with. These are these are difficult questions. Uh, a lot of time for a public a public discussion here. Agreed. Um, what you you brought up the mutation point. Um, I think one of the, the the positive aspects of thinking about a mutation is that typically with the novel pathogen. When they uh, when they mutate, they become less pathogenic. Yes, so they're less likely to cause disease. Yes, they become more transmissible, but they become less lethal. They have fewer symptoms. We've seen this with with several diseases. Um, so I think that that's good news. The, uh, you also you brought up the seasonal influenza vaccine. Um, influenza is is only slightly. I mean, it's a world of difference um, between an influenza virus and a, uh, a coronavirus. They are both RNA viruses. Um, but the, uh, the influenza goes through uh, multiple animals throughout the, the year. And so mm -hmm. that introduces a larger opportunity for it to mutate. So I think influenza will mutate at a higher rate than coronavirus will, which isn't to say that it won't mutate, but. Uh, SARS has multiple hosts too, doesn't it? It's, uh, it's snakes and turtles and uh, all sorts of strange exotic animals. So we, 
we, we've got a huge challenge here. And I think I appreciate Dr. Fauci coming out and delivering some bad news that there's no, there's no Santa Claus. There is nothing that's going to come out. So we're going to have to go forward in a social sense of deciding how we will go forward with this. Right. It's not going away. But, but uh, to, to reopen everything in the name of our economy, I think is also the wrong approach. So I think that there are smart ways to do it in ways that we can we can continue having some semblance of normal, um, but also maintain you know high standards for protection and prevention of illness. Tell me, what do you see that as being, Mike? Give me some details on reopening safely. What do you see it as? Well, I think it starts with accepting that there are certain venues that are just off the table. So indoor indoor seating, indoor bars, uh, indoor gyms, I think these are all things that we, we shouldn't even be thinking about right now. Um, not until we can get contact tracers on the ground and we can get our infection rates in our community down to low enough levels that we're, we're certain that there isn't going to be a, a, a giant spread of disease. Before that point, though, wearing face masks, only going out when you have to. I, I know your friends want to have a, you know, a big birthday party. Um, maybe don't go to that. Maybe continue doing Zoom get-togethers with, with you know, your, your friends. If you want to pick a small group of people that you spend time with who are really important to you, and they all stay as one structure that doesn't move outside of that social group, that could also help prevent the spread of, of the virus. So there are ways that we can think about this that allow us to have some semblance of norm normalcy, but it's not going to be meeting up at the bar for happy hour as if nothing is, is, is going on in the world. Uh, going back to contact tracing for a second, we've had experience with viral transmissible infectious diseases in the past, where as a society, we shun contact tracing. Anyone pop to your mind in this? HIV? <laughs> Exactly, exactly. We as a society said we are going to accept increased mortality. One of the most difficult challenges in the emergency department was to have, this is way back in the dark days when we didn't even have therapy for it, was to have an HIV positive patient that you were taking care of and having their partner there too. And you could not disclose to the partner the person's HIV status. And I'm not saying that I did it, but I know some departments where you, no matter what you'd counsel the person that was infected about using barrier protections to avoid transmission, you'd also end up having somebody go aside and re remind the other person that everybody should be using barriers unless they were sure they were negative. Uh, that was to that was to make things socially acceptable. As a society, we decided that privacy was more important than tracking and containing a disease. So I, I think we're getting to that kind of conversation now because we know the group that is going to be harmed greatly by this disease, and it's the vast majority of people won't. And there's going to be a trade-off between sitting next in the football stadium and cheering for Temple on a beautiful afternoon versus sitting in a bar versus six feet face masks. Yeah. Stay tuned. It's going to happen. Real quickly, in the last couple of minutes, and Mike, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Tell me about your current research. What are the things you're looking at? What are the things you're excited about? So I'm starting to look uh, at the county level, um, look at, looking at the increases in cases or the decreases in cases, and trying to identify what some of those characteristics are. Um, is it community uh, civic engagement? If people are more likely to vote or um, uh, you know, serve on juries or, or there's less crime, is that you were going to say? That would put a bias in people serving on juries, people voting too, wouldn't it? Because... I think it's almost possible to split people out by their attitude toward disease by other dimensions, such as politics. Yeah, absolutely. And that's unfortunate. It's really yeah. unfortunate that's the case. And I'm trying really hard not to politicize the virus, but it's a it's a political conversation. It's, it's unavoidable. So I'm interested in those things. I'm also looking at like the percent of the population over the age of 65, the percent of the population uh, who, right, um, who have diabetes or a proportion of the population. Because maybe if there's a community where, where more people are more likely to know someone who's going to be affected by the virus, that maybe they're more likely to take the precautions. So I'm curious about those dimensions of the virus. 
Um, although I should mention that I'm teaching faculty at Drexel, I'm not research faculty. So the vast majority of what I do is develop lectures and, and uh, work with students as opposed to doing my own research. All of my research I do in my free time, whatever that is. <laughs> Real quick, last comment to follow up on that. Uh, a topic that I find terribly fascinating is disaster preparedness. And you touched on that earlier when you were saying, where is it? You can go through the organizational charts of health and human services and virtually every agency has somebody that's looking at disaster response preparedness. But boy, have we gotten failing grades. And I include the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. You wanna have fun? Do a little search on a disaster pre pandemic preparedness on the Commonwealth's website. Nada, nothing meaningful there. Mike, I can't thank you enough. This has been great and wonderful. I hope you and I have have at least got some conversations going. It's been an honor to have you here today. A pleasure to be here. Thanks for the work you're doing. And everybody out there, thanks for watching The Doctor Is In. Frank Spidell inviting you to follow us.